We're coming up on Passover, which will begin the evening of the 24th of February. Yes, I realize that's not what you see online. If you want to understand God's calendar, uh, there are several videos on this channel more recently in which I've been explaining God's calendar as he reveals to me in scripture. God's calendar has been lost for a really long time, and it's no different from any other deception that has been established by the Antichrist in this world. We're living during a time where God is restoring truth uh, before he comes, but a lot of people don't want it. I mean, in fact, most people don't want it. And I take this up with him quite often is, you know, what do you have me doing if no one wants this thing? Like, who am I supposed to speak to? I, I come on here every day and I talk. I tell you what God's showing me about deception, about restoring truth. No one wants it. Very, very few. Very, very few. And the word tells us that's true. And the word also tells us that many who are insincere will join us. And we've had that experience too. But it's really, um, it's discouraging. It's really sad and discouraging and grievous that no one really wants God. And I'm finding more and more, you know, I keep getting exposed to stuff coming across my YouTube about this Hollywood God, like this Hollywood Jesus. The Jesus that's being portrayed, not only in movies, but also by Hollywood figures who are now preaching Jesus to us. What's going on, guys? What is going on in this world? It's so incredibly disgusting. I can't stand it. But these are the times we're living in. These are the times we've been called to endure. Last year during Passover, my daughter was pregnant with Jeremiah and they were going through, really going through an ordeal. This baby that medicine said that my daughter would never have, she got pregnant with. And then as, you know, I'd already been pulled out of medicine. I haven't been to a doctor in many, many years, but the kids were still going to the doctor because just because God reveals himself to the parent doesn't mean the kids have to come right along and hear everything that you hear right away. But God was pulling the kids out of medicine, and part of the way that he was doing that was exposing what medicine does in these medicalized births and, and getting you when you're vulnerable and trying to get you to do all of these procedures and, you know, inductions and cesareans and everything else. God's been making babies for a really long time, and he's been delivering babies for a really long time. And so they were, this is what they were doing, and it was really a stronghold that was being broken off of my kids, off of my family. But it was hard. It was hard because there was that little door open. And when you leave a little door open uh, for Satan, he's going to do his tricks. Like he's going to fear monger you and, you know, make you second guess. And ultimately, the kids decided not to bow down to idols. And they had that baby at home or she had that baby at home. And I got to deliver him along with his father. And it was such an incredible experience for God to align that during Passover. But it was so hard. And my, my daughter was just asking questions like, is God going to require me to sacrifice my own son? What's the best thing for me to do for my baby? And she made the right decision and God made everything good. That is one healthy child and healthy mama. This year during Passover, I'm in a position where I've given up my careers. I've given up everything that God told me to walk away from in order to do what I'm doing with you, in order to write those books, in order to work with you for free, to provide workshops and Bible study and these videos, you know, accessibility to help you to understand how you need to live your covenant. I've lived on my retirement now. I've lived on my life savings. And the last thing that I have left until I'm out of here is this uh, this building, a small commercial building that needs to be sold in order for me to live. At least that's been the plan. And it's not selling. And I, I my mortgage was due on the 1st. And I'm in that grace period on my home mortgage. And that ends tomorrow. So he really does bring us to the wall and he wants us to understand and he's definitely using these situations in order to teach all of us and using, he used my daughter last year and my family. We were all going through it, but particularly her 
as an offering. He's using me as an offering this year. I hope he uses one of somebody else next year. It's just not fun. But one thing I will say is don't let our offerings be in vain. You know, it's a lot to be exposed like this. It's a lot to go through it and to keep holding on so that others can get it, so that they can understand who God is and what he's doing. The first Passover occurred when the Exodus happened from, you know, the Exodus from Egypt. And what happened during that time, we're going to start, well, I've read these, I've read these um, stories many times on this channel and we will be reading it. But in this video, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about what Passover is. Moses had gone to, to Pharaoh several times and told Pharaoh that he needed to let the people go so that they could go worship God. And God would send a plague and he would break Pharaoh down so that he would finally concede to let the people go. And then God would harden Pharaoh's heart again. God would harden Pharaoh's heart again. God is the one who softens hearts and he's the one that hardens hearts. And so God would harden Pharaoh's heart again and he would say, never mind, I'm not going to let the people go. And then God would send another plague and then Pharaoh's heart would be softened or he'd be brought low and into position to kind of say mercy, so to speak. And he'd say, all right, all right, I'll let your people go. Just pray, you know, pray that this goes away. And then once it went away, God would harden Pharaoh's heart again. And God kept doing this over and over. And finally, he said to Moses that he was going to lead the people out of Egypt. And he commanded him that they were to take a lamb, a year old, so, and this was during the birthing season of lambs. We know this because of the reference to the barley harvest on this particular year, because contrary to what's been taught in counterfeit Christianity, these date specific holy days do not land on the same day on the same season every year. And in fact, the first Passover did not occur during spring. It occurred during winter, the end of winter. Well, technically in Egypt, Spring begins on March 20th, so it's possible that it was kind of going into spring. But, you know, counterfeit Christianity acts like this is like in the midst of spring. The birthing season of the lambs is between February and March. And so in Israel, this would have been in the winter. In Egypt, it could have been spring. Like it could have been the tail end of spring or the, the beginning of spring, the tail end of the winter. So God told Moses that you're to take a lamb, a year old without defect, a male lamb, bring it into your home, care for it for four days. On the fourth day, on the 14th at twilight, you're to take that lamb and slaughter the lamb, roast it with bitter herbs. That's the Passover meal. And you eat unleavened bread. You rid your house of yeast. Yeast represents sin, but there's also another reason why God said rid your house of yeast. And the reason why is because he wanted us to remember that on Passover, that God brought judgment on the Egyptians and that the Israelites left so quickly. So he says weird things like tuck your, your uh, you know, shirt into your, or your cloak into your belt, staff in hand, you know, sandals on your feet, eat that meal in haste and, you know, don't put any, rid your house of yeast. Okay. We rid our house of sin. You see the representation but rid your house of yeast because you're not going to add, you're going to leave so quickly, you're not even going to have time to add yeast to your bread. You won't have time to add yeast to your flour or to your dough. And that's exactly what happened. And so he had them dip the hyssop into the blood of the lamb and they put the blood of the lamb over their doorways and that signaled the destroying angel to pass over them. This is why it's so inappropriate for us to call this Easter. First of all, Easter is a pagan holiday lifted up to a false god, Ishtar. It is not a Christian holiday or holy day. And there is no difference between Christian holy days and Jewish holy days. That's ridiculous. It's completely without understanding. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism of true Judaism, of, you know, we are considered to be spiritual Jews through circumcision of the heart. It's crazy that we have these, this like 
split idea, this compartmentalized idea that there are Jews and then there are Christians. What's the matter with these people who think this way? Is, is the Bible compartmentalized just for ethnic Jews and then for Gentiles? Would you like a compartmentalized covenant? Because that's essentially, if that's what you believe, that's what you've got. So that means Jews will be saved and you won't. That doesn't make sense, guys. Even ethnic Jews don't fall into the category of spiritual Jew unless they're circumcised in heart. There's no favoritism. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female in the kingdom of God. The fulfillment of the law through Jesus' sacrifice extended salvation, the opportunity for salvation to the Gentiles. So everything that we see in the Old Testament is 100% relevant to us. And I don't see how anyone could understand the New Testament if they don't understand the Old and vice versa. You can't understand the New Testament. Excuse me. You can't understand the Old Testament if you don't understand the New because it's the fulfillment. How can you even know why Jesus had to die? Why he, why he had to die? Why he had to be sacrificed? When I was baptized into counterfeit Christianity, that was one of my questions. Like, why did Jesus have to die? And no one could give me an answer. You know why? Because they don't read their word. So that night, they rid their houses of yeast. They eat the meal in haste because they're going to be leaving. And they're going to be leaving quickly. And so God sent the destroying angel and all of the homes that had the blood of the lamb on it, the seal of God, the seal of the lamb. All of those homes were spared. But every other home... Every Egyptian household, their human beings, their livestock, the firstborn of every Egyptian household, humans and livestock alike, died. Is God sovereign or is that a very specific virus? No, God is sovereign. He did that. And he was able to spare the Israelites, those who obeyed him. Wow, that is a really specific virus. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic because people act like viruses have more power than God, like as though God doesn't send plague. People act like, oh, we need to go study this so that we know how it works and then we can outsmart what God sends. So the Israelites left quickly and they plundered the Egyptians on their way out. You know why? Because God softens hearts and God hardens hearts and he made the Egyptians favorably disposed to the Israelites so that they gave them gold and clothing and whatever they needed. So the Egypt, uh, excuse me, the Israelites plundered the Egyptians on their way out. This is the story of the first Passover. And so then God commanded that that first night that you are to eat the lamb with bitter herbs. So you eat the Passover meal. And then the next day, okay, so God's day would be that night and the following day. But the next day, on the 15th would be would would begin the following evening to the following day on the 15th begins the festival of unleavened bread and for 7 days you're to eat unleavened bread why because he wanted you to remember that you didn't have that israelites did not have enough time to even add yeast to their dough while they were you know pharaoh got up and said up oh, you guys out of here leave go worship your god bless me <laughs> i always chuckle at that cuz it's kind of weird like you know, you've been a turd this whole time, and now you're like, bless me. So the Israelites were spared. They were passed over. Jesus, when he came, was crucified on Passover. We know that. He had the Passover meal with the apostles that evening, and he was arrested that evening. And the next day, he was crucified. Do you remember that he extended the covenant that evening? He taught the apostles this is what you are to do in remembrance of me. This is the covenant that I'm ex extending to you. Oh, this is very interesting. In Luke 22, it says, Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Okay, but here's what's weird. This is interesting. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. That's kind of weird. I have not understood it that way because in Leviticus 23, it says the Passover and then it talks about on the 15th 
the festival of unleavened bread occurs or begins. Now I know this, I know that during the Passover, you're also eating unleavened bread, but let's take a look at Leviticus 23 because I don't know how to reconcile this. I mean, we observe this every year and on the 14th that evening, we are observing the Passover and then on the 15th starts the day of unleavened bread. So let's see. It says the Passover and the festival of unleavened, of unleavened bread. That's the heading. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred time, sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present a food offering to the Lord. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Okay, it doesn't mention anything about the lamb there. Uh, but that was the command in Exodus. So let's go to Exodus, Exodus 12. We're going to look for the, we're going to look at the first command and then we're going to look at subsequent commands like in numbers and um, wherever else this is, this is commanded. I can't remember where else it is. The very first command was Lord, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for the, a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to, to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted. Oh, it's seen the same night. This is so weird. I've, I've never noticed that, by the way, in Luke. I, I know that the Festival of Unleavened Bread is also referred to as the Passover, so it's all part of the Passover but Luke is making it sound like you're eating this on the 15th day of the month when the Festival of Unleavened Bread starts. But here he's saying, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must sw slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay, I, that's all I explained to you, right? We're, we're even checking my work. I hope you don't mind that I'm doing this with you in real time because we need to know, you know, what the truth is. So the first you know, the first time that this was commanded, that's how it was done. It was eaten that night. Okay, the next context is Leviticus, which is what I read, Leviticus 23. And now I'm going to go to Numbers uh, uh, chapter 9. The Lord spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they came out of Egypt. He said, have the Israelites celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. Celebrate it at the appointed time at twilight on the 14th day of the month in accordance with all its rules and regulations. So Moses told the Israelites to celebrate the Passover, and they did so in the desert of Sinai at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. The Israelites did everything just as, as the Lord commanded Moses. But some of them could not celebrate the Passover on that day. Okay, so then he introduces the, um, the second Passover. So we're not finding... I think what, I, what I'm understanding is that the Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread are being used kind of interchangeably, even though... Leviticus seems to make it, you know, makes this distinction between the Passover beginning on the 14th and then the Festival of Unleavened Bread beginning on the 15th, even though during the Passover you're also eating unleavened bread. But as far as what I'm reading, guys, it's, it, it's demonstrating that you're eating the actual lamb dinner on the 14th of the month. It's just kind of weird that it says, Luke 22, verse 7, then came the day of unleavened bread on which, it, and it says the day of unleavened bread. So maybe that was being used interchangeably with Passover. Ah, yes, because the beginning of chapter 22, I'm, I'm, I'm going through this also because there is someone on the channel who keep, kept asking me this question and now I see why he was confused about it. 
and where the confusion is coming from. So I think this is it. In verse 1 of Luke 22, it says, Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. And then here it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So it sounds like the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb is sacrificed is used interchangeably with Passover. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want for us to prepare it? Because so we we know that this would have been on the 14th because that was the command and there hasn't been a command to change the rules. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want, want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I meet the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the, ha- when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, this is what I was initially wanting to read, but had to go on that trail. But that's okay because, you know, you might come across it and wonder the same thing. Well, wait a minute. I thought we were doing uh, Passover on the 14th, right? And, and you are. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So until the Passover finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God, let me tell you what that means. At the beginning of the seven year period, there's a seal put on God's people, on the servants of God in Revelation 7. It's they're put on the 144,000, which are the two witnesses. I realize that that's a little confusing. I, I do plenty of videos on that. If you have questions about it, ask me in the comments section um, and I will engage you because I want you to know uh, that the two witnesses are the 144,000. I want you to know that. And the seal is put on them before the first four trumpets blow because they're going to die after the fourth trumpet. When the fifth trumpet blows, that's when they're going to die. So they don't need to be sealed for the, you know, trumpets uh five six and seven when trumpet number five blows the beast is going to rise from the abyss you see in revelation nine when that fifth trumpet blows that there's a star that falls from the sky satan has been kicked out of the heavenly realms and we're told why in revelation 12 we're told that the reason he's kicked out of the heavenly realms he has lost his place in heaven is because the witnesses have completed their testifying and the blood of the lamb has been fulfilled. Those are the two things that are required in order to triumph over the devil. Doesn't mean anyone's going up in some rapture because we don't get resurrected until we've fulfilled our covenant. This whole thing is not just about triumphing over the devil. You have to triumph over the devil as an individual. You have to choose Christ. In Ezekiel chapter 9, there it is described that a certain number of people are being sealed. A mark is being put on their forehead before the first six trumpets. And that is referring to the multitude in white robes. They're going to be here until the sixth trumpet. And then at the seventh trumpet, the resurrection takes place. So they're not sealed for the seventh trumpet because they're going to go up in the resurrection. That seal, don't get tripped up on the word Mark, because I know, you know, when we hear Mark, we're like, oh, I don't want that one. I want the seal. Thank you very much. But they're talking about the seal of God. This seal passes over us. It is like the blood of the lamb that has signaled the destroying angel to pass over us. And you see that very clearly in Revelation 9 when it's described that there are going to be terrible plagues because now the people have killed God's prophets and the woes begin. And those plagues are going to touch everyone who does not have the seal of God. This is beginning the fulfillment. It's it, This is part of that fulfillment, that God's wrath is not going to touch his people. Why? Because they have the seal of the lamb. They have the blood of the lamb on them. His name is on their forehead. So when the destroying angel comes, the destroying angel knows to pass over them. You think the people, all these, like the Hollywood Jesus that's so popular now, do you think they're going to have the Passover seal of the lamb? No, guys. Only those who believe and obey. Show me you believe by obeying. That's the fulfillment of Passover, is that you will be passed over when God destroys the wicked. But I want to tell you something else. You won't be passed over by the Antichrist. Do you know that? 
do you realize that everybody is going to, uh, all of God's people are going to die. Everyone going up in the first resurrection is going to die. We can see in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, that, that many of the wise are going to instruct many, though for a time they're going to die by the sword. And many who are insincere will join them. They're going to be burned and die by the sword. There's talk of starvation and captivity, human beings being sold as slaves. I mean, all of this is discussed in the Bible. I don't know why anyone would think that they're going to be spared from all of that. The Passover seal of the Lamb is what is required in order for you to not be eternally destroyed. Christ already told you, don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but be afraid of the one who kills both body and soul in hell. Oh, you thought it was easy? You thought you just were like, oh, I'm not going to be afraid because God's not going to let anyone do anything to me. That's not true. That's not what the word says. The word says that even the witnesses, the witnesses, the prophets of God, that they're going to go into jail for 10 days to be tested. And let me tell you what happened last time the Antichrist rose because, you know, no one seems to understand that the Antichrist rose already once. In Revelation 17, it tells us that it once was, now is not, but is going to rise again. So no, it's not a man. It couldn't possibly be a man. Unless there's some man on the earth that's like, you know, thousands of years old. The word tells us that the Antichrist is Satan and that many Antichrists have come, children of Satan, the kingdom of Satan. And then the word proceeds to describe the Antichrist as a kingdom. This kingdom of counterfeit religion be that began with the harlot Catholic Church, it has infected everything. It's infected Christianity. It's infected Judaism. A lot of the things that those calling themselves Jews are doing right now came from the harlot Catholic Church. There was no Saturday in the Bible. What is Saturday Sabbath? They changed the calendar that God established, adding another calendar, removing things from it, adding a leap year. They did this in order to accommodate the Gregorian calendar established by the Harlot Catholic Church. That kingdom, by the way, tortured God's people, fed them to wild animals, burned them at the stake, sawed them in half. You think we're going to escape that? You think it's going to be different for the witnesses who have been prophesying for 1260 days? And now they're part of the reason, they are, they're the second reason why Satan has lost his place in, in the heavenly realms. What do you think is going to happen to them during that 10 days they're being tested? Probably the same thing, if not worse, as what happened the first time the Antichrist rose. And by the way, they know. They know they're going to die. God let me know pretty early on that I was going to die for what I was doing before I even knew the role that I was filling. He was testing me for this role. Am I going to be afraid of this? No, I'm not going to be afraid of those who killed the body. I will be afraid of the one who can kill both body and soul in hell because what awaits me is eternity. This life, as God has made very clear to me in the last couple of weeks, does not belong to me. I don't get to choose what I'm doing in this life. It doesn't belong to me. It's not a life that I can take for myself. It's not a life that I can take away. It's not a life that I can do anything but submit to him with. He's made that very clear to me. He's made it very clear in his word. So that's what I will do. And when that seventh trumpet blows, I will rise to receive my allotted inheritance and I will be passed over. He will not bring destruction on me. And if you do the same, he will not bring destruction on you. Even though you will have been killed by the Antichrist, he will not bring destruction on you. That will be the end of your suffering. That's it. And there's not that much time, guys. There's not that much time. You can do anything for this amount of time if it means inheriting eternity. If you don't start wrapping your heart around that now, it's going to be very difficult to stand when the time comes. And I can tell you that from personal experience because the things that God has me live out in this role are extremely difficult. They are incredibly difficult. But I have to keep making my choice known. That's my covenant. That's what I'm doing here. I have to keep making my choice known. Please consider the things that I've said. Please discern them with God. And please ask him to turn your heart toward who you need to be and what you need to do and who you need to be sharing this with.